Fearing for his safety in the face of the tribunal ascendancy of his political opponent, Publius Clodius, the Roman statesman and orator Cicero fled Rome for Macedonia. After he was gone, Clodius passed a law declaring him an exile. Shortly after this, Clodius built a small temple on the site of Cicero's home to the Roman goddess Libertas, the embodiment of liberty. By consecrating it to the deity, Clodius rendered the land legally uninhabitable. When Cicero returned two years later, Libertas was there, obstructing him from his own home. Liberté, the French rendering of Libertas, is the name of the statue that stands between Jersey City, New Jersey and Brooklyn, New York. Its full title is La Liberté éclairant le monde. Designed by Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, La Liberté was built for the United States in 1886, but what was not included was a pedestal. There was no foundation for Liberty, nothing under her feet. As conductor of the Art Loan Fund exhibition in aid of the Bartholdi Pedestal Fund for the Statue of Liberty, William Maxwell Evarts solicited Emma Lazarus, a well-to-do poet and advocate for Eastern European Jewish refugees, to write an original poem to donate to the auction. At first she refused. A statue did not stir her empathy. But refugees did. She was persuaded by appealing to her work with Jews fleeing Russian pogroms to the United States. Herself a Jew, Lazarus was persuaded to write the poem on behalf of those for whom she so passionately advocated. Lazarus finished The New Colossus in 1883 for the auction, and then it was largely forgotten. La Liberté was dedicated in 1886. Lazarus died just one year later, likely of Hodgkin's lymphoma. It wasn't until 14 years later, in 1901, that a friend of Lazarus happened to find her forgotten poem in a bookshop. In another two years, after a public effort to revive it, the poem was engraved on a plaque on the interior of the statue's pedestal. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she, with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Formally, the poem is a Petrarchan sonnet, having 14 lines split into two asymmetrical parts with differing rhyme schemes, an octave and a sestet, each accomplishing different things. The octave maintains its distance from its metaphorical objects in the perspective of an observer, circumspectly regarding the past, the present, the future. Its gaze moves from contemplating the old world, the new world, the immediate vicinity, the physical aspect of the Mother of Exiles. The sestet, on the other hand, sets off the Mother of Exiles' speech, shifting vigorously away from the circular, third-person, enclosed rhyming scheme of the octave in favor of a two-dimensional, alternating rhyme and direct second-person address, her speech resounding from imperative verbs, keep, give, send. But the poem is by no means at war with itself. A close reading reveals that it is unified as a polemic, a repudiation, a contradiction. The poem is radically negative. It is, before all else, not. It rejects the masculine semiotic embodied in the mythic Colossus of Rhodes, whose power issues from a phallic center, balancing at the apex of imperial domination between land to land. In place of virile masculinity, the poem offers the feminine a mighty woman, mother of exiles, negating even her own name, Libertas, in favor of openness, fertility, possibility. The Mother of Exiles transforms the closed sign of a relationship of domination and control toward death into the decentered relationship of worldwide welcome, whose torch imprisons the destructive power of lightning and instead suffuses its light 
in all directions. Instead of conquering limbs standing astride the harbor, it is free air that frames these twin cities. In contrast, the huddled masses of the old world team on a packed shore, yearning to breathe free. The critique imagines a clogged Europe, sedimented, closed in, asthmatic. In a trumpeting call, the Mother of Exiles rejects all this. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp. Storied can be read as the sedimentary centuries of accumulated waste and neglected people by old and myopic power. It can also be read as his storied, the male-centric story held dominant as long as power concentrates in men's hands, devaluing women, the poor, the tired, the weak, the different. It is around this time that the warmongering President Theodore Roosevelt and other intellectuals are writing openly of an impending white race suicide in the face of increased immigration from Eastern Europe. The US had just completed its first overseas colonial imperialist venture against Cuba, Guam, and the Philippines involving the torture and internment of native populations. The next decades would see mounting legislation to restrict and regulate immigration. It is against these storied and his storied forces driving people from their homes that the new colossus stands. Countertexts bubble in through the cracks of such negation. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates, the reactionary text of nationalism threatens to appropriate the rejection in a new closure, a recentering made with walls facing east, purified by water and cursed with salt. Meanwhile, how can silent lips cry out the feminine challenge to his story? Only as an embodied sign, a text open to interpretation, misinterpretation, counterinterpretation. While the Colossus of Rhodes closes the sign and defies interpretation, the new Colossus, decentered, becomes susceptible to masculine misreading. In the rendering on the plaque, the Sestet's first line appears without the comma, setting off the address to ancient lands, removing the clarity of the entire line. Ambiguously, she seems no longer to deny the storied pomp, but rather to desire that it somehow be held, that it remain in play. So easily, this mother of exiles becomes only the Statue of Liberty, inert, a screen projected upon by the waves of national interest an old colossus. In its polemic of negation, not male, not Europe, not centered, the new colossus seems to bear within it the recognition that the accomplishment of the Mother of Exile's speech act requires nothing less than an eruption of history, a breaking or bursting perpendicular to the present course, to the asymmetrical, brazen, storied pomp of the ways we've always thought. Given the events of our own time and place and looking back, is the golden door open or closed? Have we closed the sign in on its meaning, declared our mythic charity sufficient, finished? By erecting and consecrating our own shrine to liberty, have we inadvertently made the land uninhabitable? <laughs>